Hi, I'm Karen Tong from Loma Linda University, California. It's a pleasure to be co-moderating this session with Dr. Katie Trailer. I'm happy to introduce the next three presenters who are all excellent speakers and renowned invited lecturers. Next up is Dr. Ashok Srinivasan, Director of Neuroradiology at the University of Michigan, who will be lecturing us on tinnitus, where to start, where to stop. Hello, everyone. It's great to meet everyone virtually here. I'd like to thank Ilona for this opportunity. Over the course of this particular talk, I'm going to be focusing on the classification of tinnitus and then discuss the role of imaging in its evaluation. Tinnitus is a sound that is perceived without an external stimulus being present. So some patients describe it as a buzzing sound. Others might say it's a ringing sound or a whistling sound and so on. It's not surprising to understand that it affects many of us. So about 40 million people uh, are generally are affected by tinnitus at some time or other in their life. The severity of tinnitus tends to vary from something that's barely noticeable. So people feel it or hear it rather and go on with their daily activities and life. But others, they actually are severely debilitated by the uh, loudness of this sound that it can lead to mental health issues such as depression. Therefore, it is important for us to have a critical approach towards tinnitus. First of all, you need to have a detailed history available. And in the history, you need to look, you need to look for associated symptoms such as headache, vertigo, hearing loss, and so on. This needs to be followed by a physical exam, then otological exam, and finally, audiological testing. This comprises a full clinical evaluation and this needs to be done prior to ordering any imaging tests for the evaluation of tinnitus. Tinnitus itself can be classified in two ways. One, whether it uh, coincides with the heartbeat or not. In that case, you would call it non-pulsatile versus pulsatile. And in the other way, you can think of it as sound that is perceived by the patient alone, which in case would be called subjective or is perceived by both the patient and somebody standing next to the patient, in which case it would be objective. So more people have non-pulsatile tinnitus compared to pulsatile tinnitus and more people have subjective tinnitus compared to objective tinnitus. Another way to think about it is most people who have non-pulsatile tinnitus have the subjective variety, whereas people who have pulsatile tinnitus may have the subjective variety if the sound is not that loud and may have the subjective and objective variety if the sound is loud enough to be perceived by others as well. Let's first look at non-pulsatile tinnitus. Well, this is most commonly associated with functional injuries. So somebody has been associated uh, rather exposed to loud noises or has a medication that has caused this toxicity. Those are some of the common things that you will encounter in the history when you look at a patient with non-pulsatile tinnitus. And therefore, it is not surprising that when most patients with non-pulsatile tinnitus get an imaging evaluation, we do not discover imaging abnormalities. So if imaging is needed in these patients, it's important that we also look at correlated symptoms. So is there headache? Is there hearing loss in those symptoms in order to decide an appropriate imaging study? And for the most part, most people agree that MRI of the brain, specifically the eighth cranial nerve focused MRI of the brain would be the study of choice for evaluation of non-pulsatile tinnitus. The reason for this is because the most important pathological condition we are trying to discover is a cerebellopontine angle tumor like a vestibular schwannoma. There are of course other causes of non-pulsatile tinnitus that might be evident on MR such as abnormalities in the brainstem, abnormalities in the cerebellum, even abnormalities in the brain parenchyma or the craniocervical junction like MS or Chiari malformation. But a word of caution, these are usually diagnosis of exclusion. So if we are unable to find another cause that can be attributed to non-pulsatile tinnitus, then perhaps these might be the cause of pulsatile tinnitus or rather non-pulsatile tinnitus in these patients. Let's now focus on pulsatile tinnitus for the rest of this talk. This is a type of tinnitus as we just described can be either subjective or subjective and objective. So in most patients who present with objective pulsatile tinnitus, the workup will often disclose an imaging abnormality. So what is the workup? Well, it can differ from institution to institution, but 
at my institution we start off with a ct of the temporal bone along with a ct angiogram of the head neck this enables us to pick up abnormalities of the temporal bone itself but also abnormalities of the vascular system that might result in pulse style tinnitus you could start off with an mri of the brain specifically a cranial nerve 8 protocol mri of the brain and add an mr angiogram and that can also achieve similar results and if either of these two uh, approaches don't work or are unable to show the actual culprit you could then go to a conventional catheter angiogram if the clinical suspicion of an entity like arteriovenous fistula is quite high let's start off our discussion by looking at how do we approach pulse style tinnitus the first thing i would look for is is there a vascular tumor present specifically these are going to be vascular tumors in the vicinity of the temporal bone and skull base and one common entity you should be looking for is a paraganglioma entities such as uh, glomus jugulari glomus tympanicum or glomus jugulo tympanicum happen to be pretty close to the uh, inner ear structures so the enhanced flow through these hypervascular tumors could be perceived as pulse style tinnitus here is an example of a patient with right sided pulse style tinnitus showing the classical salt and pepper appearance so salt is the bright area on t1 weighted images pepper is the presence of flow voids on t2 weighted images with intense post contrast enhancement so this is a classical glomus jugulari on the right side the patient also has slow flow within the ipsilateral sigmoid sinus so this is a patient that had pulse style tinnitus another patient who had uh, pulse style tinnitus on the left side is depicted here this is a patient with salt and pepper appearance on the left side again with hyper enhancing lesion and we have a correlative ct here that shows a clear permeative osseous margin while the best test to diagnose a paraganglioma at the skull base or temporal bone would be a combination of both mri with contrast and ct correlation it is because while MRI can classically show the salt and pepper appearance, the CT margins of a permeative nature help us distinguish this from an entity like schwannoma or meningioma that can also occur in a similar location. While it is not the only tumor that can cause pulse style tinnitus at the skull base, you can have hypervascular metastasis, for example, from renal cell carcinoma that can also cause pulse style tinnitus. So we have looked at one major category, which is vascular tumor. The next one is going to be vascular malformation. These come in various flavors. They are either going to be an arteriovenous malformation where the artery and vein communicate in an abnormal way, but with the presence of a nidus or an arteriovenous fistula where the artery and vein again communicate in an abnormal way, but without the presence of nidus. Here is an example of a patient with an AV malformation in the right carotid sheath. So if you look at the left side for comparison, this looks normal. The right side is expanded and has multiple flow voids within it. And this patient underwent a conventional catheter angiogram based on the MRI suspicion, which clearly demonstrated that contrast was able to get into the nidus and shunted early within the um, right jugular vein so this was a complex av malformation in the right carotid sheath that was causing a lot of pulse style tinnitus here is another patient with an intracranial av malformation which is known to be associated with pulse style tinnitus though to a little lesser extent compared to a skull base avm another entity we should be aware of is arteriovenous fistula this is where the communication occurs without the presence of nidus one way to pick up an arteriovenous fistula on cross-sectional imaging is by carefully looking at time of flight MR angiogram images. The way these images are typically acquired, you should have flow related enhancement within the arterial system, but you should have no hyper enhancement or no high signal within the venous system because the flow from the venous system in a cranial to caudal direction has automatically been suppressed. So if you discover flow within the venous system on a time of flight MR angiogram, it could be a clue that some of the protons from the arterial system have escaped quickly into the venous system and are being seen on this image. So this is nicely demonstrated in this patient with a left-sided pulse tinnitus. So the presence of 
increased signal within the transverse sigmoid sinuses and the jugular bulb in an ipsilateral asymmetric fashion suggests that there is venous shunting. So these patients would then undergo a catheter angiogram. This is an external carotid lateral picture that shows the shunting between the arterial system and the venous system. So just to orient everyone, this is the internal maxillary artery going anteriorly. The artery that has this nice um, 90 degree curvature at the skull base is the middle meningeal artery and the artery with the nice convoluted uh, course posteriorly is the occipital artery. So we have feeders from both middle meningeal and occipital artery that dump into the transverse sinus which then empties into the sigmoid as well as the jugular bulb. Here is another patient with a very loud um, pulse style tinnitus and this was objective because when we went close to this patient prior to doing an angiogram, you could hear this sound. Of course, if you kept a stethoscope on the neck of this patient, it was even louder. So the MR angiogram, which is a contrast enhanced MR angiogram in this patient, demonstrates something that looks very complicated. You have the normal arterial system opacified, but you also have a large um, left jugular vein that is seen on this image with complicated venous structures on both sides. So this appears to be a very complex AV fistula or AV malformation. When we did the angiogram on this patient, these are right external carotid and left external carotid injections. We discovered that this was a complex AV fistula which was supplying multiple dilated venous structures that had actually inter side communication. So this was communicating right to left as well and eventually was draining down the left jugular vein. So when this patient was embolized with many of these vessels being occluded, the patient had significant improvement in symptoms. So two broad categories we have discussed so far are vascular tumors and vascular malformations. The third category we'll look at is vascular anomalies. Now vascular anomalies are those that are present either since birth or have slowly developed over a period of time. One might ask why then would a vascular anomaly that might be present for a long period of time suddenly cause pulse style tinnitus? Well the hypothesis is that the flow within these vascular anomalies can change over the course of a patient's life. For example, you have an aberrant carotid artery the flow velocities in that aberrant carotid might change due to a proximal stenosis and that change in flow might be perceived as tinnitus by the patient. However, when you discover a vascular anomaly in a patient with pulse style tinnitus, please remember that it might just be an incidental observation. Therefore, it is best for you to continue the search for another treatable cause of the patient's symptom before you conclude that this might be the cause of the pulse style tinnitus. Here is an example of a high riding jugular bulb. This by itself is usually not a cause of pulse style tinnitus, but this is an entity that occurs if the jugular bulb extends above the level of the floor of the internal auditory canal or tympanic annulus. When this is associated with thinning of the bony covering, the so-called jugular bulb dehiscence, this can be associated with pulse style tinnitus. So be careful about detecting this entity. And in some patients, it is not only dehiscent, it also protrudes in an abnormal fashion. So this is a jugular bulb diverticulum. So remember, jugular bulb dehiscence and diverticula can be a cause of pulse style tinnitus. Now, how do we diagnose these anomalies? We can actually diagnose jugular bulb anomalies on thin section bone algorithm temporal bone CT. We really do not need contrast to make that diagnosis. However, if you do a combination study like at my institution where we get CT temporal bone and CT angiogram in the same patient, it might make it easier to identify that this indeed is the region of a jugular bulb. An MR angiogram or MR venogram would also be helpful in some instances. But please do not make the diagnosis of a jugular bulb anomaly on a spin echo MR. So these are axial T1, axial T2 weighted images. The reason we should not be trying to make a diagnosis of jugular bulb anomaly on these spin echo MRs is because the signal within the skull base, cortical bone, the mastoid air cells and the jugular vein are all going to appear dark. So it is not possible to clearly delineate where the margin of the jugular bulb is. And therefore, making a diagnosis of a jugular bulb anomaly on a spin echo MR can be fallacious. 
Well, this is another patient who presented with a loud left-sided pulse style tinnitus. He was 48 year old and he had a whooshing sound. Before we ended the study and said this is absolutely normal, you should carefully look at the region of the sigmoid plate. So this is the region of the sigmoid plate where the sigmoid sinus starts transitioning into the vertical segment. And note whether this has a clear anterior osseous covering. In this particular patient, it looks like there is no osseous covering. So this is sigmoid plate dehiscence. This classically affects the lateral wall and the upper segment and is a very, very important treatable cause of pulse style tinnitus. So if you detect this, the patients have a high chance of cure after surgery where the surgeons would put a graft that prevents the pulsations from being transmitted into the mastoid air cells. If you have a, a lateral projection, this is called a sigmoid diverticulum. Now, this is another patient who had pulse style tinnitus on the right side. So, this is a sigmoid plate dehiscence with diverticulum. Now, we have contrast on board and you can see in the second image here where the contrast opacified blood vessel does not have a bone that separates it from air within the mastoid air cells. You can see it on the axial view as well. So, again, very important treatable cause of pulse style tinnitus that you should be detecting. There are other vascular anomalies that are probable causes of pulse style tinnitus if you do not have other causes that you can find on imaging and one of them is the aberrant carotid artery. Now I know embryology is our favorite subject so let us look at the embryology of the aberrant carotid artery. So in the normal individual the internal carotid artery has two segments that develop separately in the embryological stage. So there is a cervical segment and an intracranial segment. So in some patients, the cervical segment never develops, but the brain still needs its blood supply. So what it does is it uses a bypass route. So the bypass route is a carotico-tympanic branch of the petrous carotid artery, anastomosis with inferior tympanic artery, which is a branch of ascending pharyngeal. It's a tiny vessel normally, but in a patient with aberrant carotid artery, the inferior tympanic and carotico-tympanic really enlarge a carotid artery. There's only one major difference between the normal individual and the patient with aberrant carotid artery. So instead of the carotid, carotid canal, it is laterally at inferior tympanic canaliculus. So in this sense, the shape of the carotid artery from a frontal view starts looking like a 7 or a reverse 7 if it's on the other side. This is an example of an aberrant carotid artery uh, which courses typically over the cochlear promontory. So this is something that will look reddish through the otoscope like a reddish mass. And on the AP view, if you do contrast enhanced views, it will look like the 7 or reversed 7 sign. Here is a young patient with a vascular middle-ear mass on otological exam and this is uh, a lesion that is contiguous with the petrous segment of the internal carotid artery. When we give contrast, it becomes quite clear that this indeed is an aberrant carotid artery and this can be a cause of pulse style tinnitus if other causes are ruled out. Now, this is a different patient. This is our petrous carotid artery. And I want you to carefully watch this small blood vessel that arises from the petrous carotid and slowly courses uh, more lateral over the cochlear promontory and then ends up at the anterior footplate of the stapes. So this is the persistent stapedial artery. So the persistent stapedial artery is normally a really, really tiny vessel in the embryological stage which disappears later. So if it is persistent, it can cause problems. It can complicate middle and inner ear surgeries and because it is very close to the cochlear promontory, it can cause pulse style tinnitus. And how do we diagnose the persistent stapedial artery? Well, for one, you can trace a small blood vessel from the petrous carotid making its way towards the cochlear promontory. And you can also sometimes see the tympanic portion of the facial nerve canal be enlarged. But there is a third clue that is absence of the foramen spinosum. So in this particular patient, the right foramen spinosum is absent, the left is present. The foramen spinosum normally carries the middle meningeal artery, that's a branch of internal maxillary artery, uh, which enters into the intracranial compartment. Interestingly, in patients with persistent stapedial artery, 
the middle meningeal actually arises from the persistent stapedial artery itself and then enters the intracranial compartment through the anterior wall of middle ear cavity. Therefore, there is no need for a foramen spinosum to develop which to, to allow the artery for, to go from the internal maxillary at all. So, if you have an absence of the foramen spinosum, it's an indirect sign that you could be dealing with a persistent stapedial artery. There are other vascular causes of tinnitus described in the literature, such as stenosis of the transverse sinus, or enlargement of the emissary veins, or even dissection of the carotid artery. Again, all of these are going to be diagnosis of exclusion only if you do not find other more treatable causes of uh, pulsatile tinnitus. Having said that, important to remember that if you do think the transverse sinus stenosis is the cause of pulsatile tinnitus, it might be treatable through stenting. There are some non-vascular causes which are again attributed to tinnitus if other entities have been excluded and these include otosclerosis. This is a patient with fenestral and cochlear otosclerosis who had pulsatile tinnitus. You could have pulsatile tinnitus with Paget disease because of the increased blood flow through the bones of the skull base. And in some instances, patients with Meniere's disease have alteration in the flow dynamics of the endolymphatic system which causes pulsatile tinnitus. So, in summary, most patients with tinnitus will not have imaging abnormalities. When you have a patient with non pulsatile tinnitus who is referred for imaging, the best test to start off with would be an MRI brain to look for a lesion at the cerebellopontine angle system. If you have a patient with pulsatile tinnitus who is referred for imaging, you have multiple options to choose from, so which include a combination of CT temporal bone, CT angiogram, MRI brain, MR angiogram and eventually catheter angiography as a troubleshooting technique. And remember, if you follow a three-pronged approach to pulsatile tinnitus, which is look for vascular tumors, look for vascular malformations and look for vascular anomalies, especially something like sigmoid plate dehiscence that can be treated, you will be doing a service to all these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Our fifth speaker is the esteemed Dr. Deborah Reedy past president of ASHNR, past recipient of the ASHNR Gold Medal Award, and currently chair of radiology at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. She'll be teaching us about Horner syndrome, where to start, where to stop. So for the next 20 minutes, we'll be discussing Horner syndrome. We're gonna review the anatomy of the ocular sympathetic pathway, learn to localize lesions based on clinical findings, and this is gonna help you tailor the imaging evaluation. And then I'll demonstrate different types of pathology that you can encounter at various levels in the ocular sympathetic pathway. Horner syndrome occurs when there is an interruption of the ocular sympathetic pathway. The clinical symptoms may cause little if any functional impairment in most patients. However, since both benign and malignant disease processes are associated with Horner syndrome, a thorough clinical evaluation is required. The ocular sympathetic pathway consists of three neurons. The first order neurons found in the posterior lateral hypothalamus. The second order neurons found in the ciliospinal center. That's anywhere from C8 to T2. And the third order neurons, which are found in the superior cervical ganglion located at the, the C2-3 level. So let's see now how the ocular sympathetic uh, pathway, the fibers from this pathway go from the hypothalamus to the, to the eye. So the postganglionic fibers of the first order neurons actually descend in the reticular formation going through the brainstem, cervical, and thoracic cord to synapse and the intermediate lateral gray substance of the cord at the C8 to T2 level. The postganglionic fibers of the second order neurons exit in the ventral spinal roots and pass through the inferior and middle cervical ganglion before synapsing with the third order neuron in the superior cervical ganglion. The postganglionic fibers from the superior cervical ganglion travel with the internal and external carotid. Those that travel uh, with the internal carotid travel with it for a short distance up to the carotid, to the cavernous sinus where it attaches to the sixth cranial nerve and then ultimately on to V1 on the ophthalmic nerve and enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure and these fibers travel on the long posterior ciliary nerve, a branch of the ophthalmic nerve that goes on to innervate the Mueller muscles of the upper and lower eyelid as well as the dilator muscles of the iris. 
The fibers that travel with the external carotid travel with the blood vessels to the face and are responsible for sweating. The oculosympathetic innervation is ipsilateral to the sweat glands of the body and face, dilator muscles of the iris, and retractor muscles of the eyelid. These patients will often present with the classic triad of ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. So let's look now and see why the patients have these clinical findings. The Mueller muscle is a smooth muscle that's found on the undersurface of the levator muscle in the upper eyelid. And this muscle elevates the upper eyelid and controls the resting position of the upper eyelid when the eye is open. It's innervated by the sympathetic nervous system and when you have an interruption of the sympathetic nerve supply, this results in a drooping of the upper eyelid which is referred to as ptosis. The sphincter and dilator muscles of the iris are innervated by the autonomic nervous system and meiosis is a decrease in pupil size due to paralysis of the dilator muscles. So the sympathetics innervate the dilator muscles, the parasympathetics innervate the sphincter muscles, such that when you have an interruption of the sympathetic innervation, the parasympathetic innervation of the sphincter muscles is unopposed and the pupil will constrict, and this is meiosis. Anhydrosis is a lack of sweat production due to the interruption of the sympathetic innervation of the sweat glands. And typically, if you have unilateral absence of sweat to the forehead, face, or body, this is a good indication that you're dealing with Horner's syndrome. So how do we classify Horner's syndrome? It can be classified as preganglionic and postganglionic, and that's going to depend on where the lesion is occurring along the oculosympathetic pathway. So if the lesion is located proximal to the superior cervical ganglion, that's a preganglionic Horner syndrome. If the lesion is anywhere from the superior cervical ganglion to the eye, that's a postganglionic Horner syndrome. The preganglionic Horner syndrome can be further subdivided into the central or first order neuron Horner syndrome and the peripheral or second order neuron Horner syndrome. So central Horner syndromes occur when you have lesions that occur anywhere from the hypothalamus to the lower cervical and upper thoracic cord before the postganglionic fibers synapse with the second order neuron. The peripheral or second order neuron Horner syndrome occurs when you have a lesion that occurs anywhere from the superior cervical ganglion to the post, uh, gang, and in, uh, post gang, and along the postganglionic fibers before they synapse with the third order neuron in the superior cervical ganglion. And finally, the postganglionic Horner syndrome is sometimes referred to as a third order neuron Horner syndrome, and this is caused by lesions that occur anywhere from the superior cervical ganglion to the eye. So let's look now at the clinical evaluation. You have a patient, the patient comes in, and the patient has unequal pupil size. And this is called anisocoria. And this may be due to a number of causes, aging, sympathetic or parasympathetic um, dysfunction. And the best way to determine the etiology is to examine the patient in the dark. So the question is here, we have a patient with anisocoria. And the first question we're going to ask ourselves is, is the pupil inequality greater in the light or in the dark? If it's greater in the light, we're dealing with a parasympathetic lesion. And then if we're going to examine the patient in the dark because we're going to rely on the fact that the sympathetic denervated pupil dilates slower than the normal pupil in the dark. And this is best identified when photographs are taken at 5 and 15 seconds in the dark. And we're looking for what we call dilation lag. So we have no dilation lag when we look at the eye in the dark, then the anisocoria is physiologic. If we do have dilation lag, this indicates that we are likely dealing with the sympathetic lesion and the patient may need to go on or should go on to have chemical testing. The pharmacological testing is ideally the sequential pharmacological testing using cocaine and hydroxy and hepatamine should be done. There's usually a poor response to cocaine and that confirms the diagnosis of Horner syndrome. And then the response to hydroxyamphetamine will help you determine if the Horner syndrome is pre or post ganglionic. If the sympathetic pathway is intact, norepinephrine is released from the nerves, innervating the dilate, dilator muscles. The normal pupil will dilate and the Horner's pupil, you'll see that there's a poor response. So that means the pupil will dilate and there's a slight elevation of that lid. 
hydroxyamphetamine releases norepinephrine from the postganglionic nerve endings of the dilator muscles. So in a pregangliotic ganglionic Horner syndrome, that's first order and second order Horner syndrome, the pupil will dilate. In a postganglionic Horner syndrome, the pupil will not dilate because norepinephrine is depleted from the nerve endings. So let's look now at some cases. We are looking at the first order neuron corner syndrome here, or the central preganglionic corner syndrome cases. And this occurs when you have lesions that occur anywhere from the hypothalamus down to C8 to T2 before the postganglionic fibers synapse with the second order neurons. And this is the least common location for a preganglionic syndrome. Clinically, these patients will present with meiosis, and that may be the only evidence of a central Horner syndrome. The anhydrosis distribution at present is to the ipsilateral entire half of the body. Depending on the location of the lesion, they may present with cerebellar and brainstem findings or myelopathic findings if the lesion is involving the cord. The eye findings are demonstrated here where you'll see that there is going to be a slight response uh, to the cocaine, not as good as in the normal eye, but that it will respond to the administration of hydroxyamphetamine because this is a pre-ganglionic lesion. Here we have a list of a number of etiologies that can cause a Horner syndrome. Um, in the first order neuron distribution, there, this is all available for you to look at in your, in your hand. And as far as imaging is concerned, if someone has a first order neuron Horner syndrome with brain and brainstem symptoms, obviously we're going to do MR and maybe MRA looking at and diffusion weighted imaging looking at the brain. If there are myelopathic findings, we're going to focus on the cervical and upper thoracic spine. So Wallenberg syndrome or the lateral medullary plate infarct is the most common cause of the first order neuron Horner syndrome and this is secondary to the occlusion of pica or the vertebral artery and typically it will produce an infarct in the region where those sympathetic fibers are traveling as we see here indicated by the number six and the sort of purple arrow. These patients will also have other cranial nerve palsies in addition to the first order neuron Horner syndrome. Here we have a 13-year-old boy with headaches and left anisocoria. The pharmacological testing suggests that there is a left preganglionic corner syndrome. And here we see on the MR imaging that the patient has a lesion in the hypothalamus. This was a hypothalamic pilocytic astrocytoma. Here, a patient that presented with Horner syndrome with uh, that was alternating from eye to eye. And this is sort of maybe a classic finding that you can see in patients with syringohydromyelia, which are these patients that have these large intramedullary cysts that contain CSF and it can cause compression of the gray and white matter. And then I guess, depending on the pulsations of the CSF at any time, it may cause more compression on the sympathetic fibers on one side versus the other. So if you have a Horner syndrome that alternates from eye to eye, you should always consider the diagnosis diagnosis of syringohydromyelia. The presence of Horner syndrome in a patient with a history of demyelinating disease such as MS suggests the possibility of spinal cord involvement. Keep in mind that the MS plaques tend to occur on the dorsal lateral aspect of the cord and this is where the sympathetic fibers are traveling in the cord. Here we have a patient that demonstrates the presence of multiple um, MS plaques uh, studying both the cervical and upper thoracic cord and then on one of the axial images we see one of the plaques that's located on the dorsal lateral aspect of the cord on the left side. This explained why this patient had a left uh, preganglionic Horner syndrome. Looking now at the second order neuron Horner syndrome or what we call the peripheral preganglionic syndrome. This is caused by lesions that occur in the second order neuron or involving the postganglionic fibers before they synapse with the third order neuron. Most of the cases of preganglionic corner syndrome are secondary to lesions in this particular region. These patients often present with the full syndrome of ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. The anhydrosis distribution is to the ipsilateral face and neck and depending on the location of the lesion, the patient may also have a brachial plexopathy. The eye findings after the administration of cocaine and hydroxyamphetamine are the same as what we encounter in a patient with a first order neuron Horner syndrome. You will see that, they, that there is a uh, poor, there is a maybe a slight response to cocaine on the affected side. 
but then after the administration of hydroxyamphetamine, the pupil will dilate and there'll be slight elevation of that upper eyelid. Here, a list of a number of etiologies that cause this type of Horner syndrome. Um, this is available in your handout, so you can read this at your leisure. From an imaging point of view, the lesions can be located anywhere from the second order neuron. It can involve the nerve roots of C8 to T2 or involve portions of the neck up to the level of C2. If a mass is present on physical examination in the neck or a lesion is seen in the lung apex on a chest X-ray, you can usually do a CT scan to cover the area of interest. If you have clinical findings suggesting spine or nerve root involvement, you can usually just go ahead and do an MR. Otherwise, you would have to cover the area from C2 to T2 to include this portion of the ocular syndrome. Here, a 19-year-old male with a right preganglionic corner syndrome, we see a mass on the axial and coronal T1-weighted images that's iso-intense to muscle. The mass is well circumscribed and has a rather smooth interface with the lung apex and is causing some compression of the lung apex, indicating that we're dealing with something that's not within the lung parenchyma. And if I look on the opposite side, I can see the superior cervical ganglion on the left. So this was a sympathetic ganglion schwannoma. The cervical sympathetic chain runs over the longest coli and capitis muscles, and it's found uh, posterior medial to the carotid sheath, deep to the prevertebral fascia. And lesions can involve the carotids, uh, the cervical sympathetics, and they typically cause anterior or anterior lateral displacement of the carotid sheath structures. So here we have a patient with a lesion. Um, we can see on T1, it's iso intense to muscle, increases in signal intensity on T2, has sort of a heterogeneous enhancement pattern, and is causing anterior lateral displacement of the carotid sheath structures. This mass is resting on the anterior aspect of that prevertebral muscle. So all of these findings together would point to the fact that this is a lesion that's in the sympathetic chain. So nerve sheath tumors can arise from the sympathetic chain. And Horner's syndrome may be part of the initial presentation, but is often encountered after surgery for the removed. Now, finally, we're going to look at the uh, third order neuron Horner syndrome or post ganglionic Horner syndrome. And this occurs when you have lesions that are located anywhere from the superior cervical ganglion to the eye. They usually will have the full syndrome and usually present with ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. And you may have other clinical findings that suggest that the lesion is located in the orbit, the cavernous sinus, or a carotid dissection. So for example, orbital lesions, the patients may have ptosis, chemosis, and conjunctival hyperemia. Cavernous sinus uh, lesions may involve and may cause ipsilateral extra ocular paresis, especially with, if the uh, sixth nerve is involved and they have a Horner syndrome, remember that the sympathetic fibers travel for a short distance on the sixth cranial nerve, so they'd have the sixth nerve involvement without brainstem symptoms, and with carotid dissection, a history of trauma, neck pain, ipsilateral vision loss, and acute onset of a postganglionic corner syndrome, which suggests that you're probably dealing with a carotid dissection. The anhydrosis is to the ipsilateral face and neck if the lesion is in the superior cervical ganglion, but just to the ipsilateral nose and forehead if the lesion is distal to the superior cervical ganglion because the sympathetic fibers are traveling with the IAC to this region. Again, the eye findings in these patients, you'll see that they have a poor response to cocaine as well as a poor response to hydroxyamphetamine, indicating that you're dealing with a third order lesion. A number of etiologies uh, for third order neuron corner syndrome are listed here. I highlighted the cluster and migraine headaches because patients often come to the emergency room with these head with these uh, with, with these headaches, and you may see what looks like a, you may see the um, changes, the Horner syndrome findings, and that this is transient in these patients. So just for you to be aware that you can see transient Horner syndrome, third order Horner syndrome in patients with cluster and migraine headaches. If there are no associated uh, clinical findings, we usually do no imaging. If you have focal findings clinically, then you should scan the uh, area that you suspect the lesion to be in. If there's a history to suggest a carotid dissection, you can do CT and CTA or MR and MRAs to evaluate the patient. So here we have a patient with a carotid dissection where you can see the high signal in the left 
on the left side around the left IAC and the IAC, we see this eccentric flowboid. So this enlargement of that area adjacent to the, to the vessel right underneath the um, traveling between the blood vessel wall and the lumen can cause compression of the sympathetic fibers that are traveling in this region and then these patients will develop a Horner syndrome. Typically the Horner syndrome in these patients sometimes may even be transient. As uh, similarly when you're looking at somebody with fibromuscular dysplasia, the dilatation of the uh, vessel uh, may cause compression of the sympathetic fibers that are traveling on the outside the wall of the vessel and produce a Horner syndrome as well. This was a 46-year-old Chinese female with a nasopharyngeal carcinoma and a left third order neuron Horner syndrome. You see that there is a mass um, in the nasopharynx and that mass is coming right up to the carotid sheath structures, pressing on it and likely causing a compression of the sympathetic fibers resulting in a Horner syndrome. So we've reviewed the anatomy of the ocular sympathetic pathway. Hopefully you've learned to localize lesions based on clinical findings and that will help you tailor your imaging evaluation. Remember that a lot of times these patients may need to be evaluated by a neuro-ophthalmologist to, to have a really thorough evaluation to help localize the lesion. And we've looked at a number of lesions that we can encounter in the various levels of the ocular sympathetic pathway. So I think that now you know that there is more to Horner's syndrome than meets the eye. Thank you. Our final speaker of this session is Dr. Carlos Torres, a fellow Canadian, international lecturer, and Neuroradiology Fellowship Program Director at the University of Ottawa, Canada. And he'll be giving us a presentation on brachial plexopathy, imaging tips and findings. Hello, my name is Carlos Torres. I'm a neuroradiologist and professor of radiology at the University of Ottawa in Canada. And in the next 25 minutes, uh, we'll review the imaging tips and findings of brachial plexopathy. I have no disclosures. The objectives of this lecture are to uh, briefly discuss the anatomy of the brachial plexus, to outline the different MR protocols that could be used to image the plexus, and to review some of the pathologies that can involve the brachial plexus using a case-based approach. The brachial plexus is formed by the ventral rami of the nerves from C5 to T1 and is responsible for the motor and cutaneous innervation of most of the upper extremity. It is important to recognize the segments of the brachial plexus, which from medial to uh, lateral include the roots, the trunks, the divisions, the cords, and the branches. We teach our fellows and residents that mnemonic radiologists and technologists like to drink cold beverages so that they remember the segments of the brachial plexus from medial to lateral, again, the roots, the trunks, the divisions, the cords, and the branches. So the roots extend from the neural foramina all the way to the edge of the uh, scalene triangle, medial to the anterior scalene and muscle. At the edge of the uh, scalene triangle, the roots are going to merge to form the trunks and we're going to have an upper, a middle and a lower trunk. The trunks are going to run for a very short segment and then they're going to split into two to give an anterior and a posterior division for a total of six divisions. Then the divisions are going to run from the edge of the scalene triangle to the mid clavicular segment and this is the appearance of the divisions in the coronal plane. Then in between the uh, mid clavicular segment and the first rib, the divisions are going to turn into the cords of the brachial plexus, which will run from the mid clavicular segment to the anterior coracoid process. At the level of the anterior coracoid process, the cords turn into the proximal branches of the brachial plexus. MRI is definitely the method of choice to image the brachial plexus due to its multiplanar capabilities and exquisite soft tissue contrast. There are multiple ways of imaging the brachial plexus and this is going to depend on the type of magnet that you have and uh, it will depend on your institution's uh, protocols. I would like to uh, share with you the two protocols that I use at my institution. This first protocol is the one that we use with the 3T magnets or with the uh, newer 1.5T magnets. 
is a uh, short and sweet protocol only for sequences as you can see here three coronal one sagittal my preferred uh, to go sequence is the first one which is a high resolution isotropic uh, coronal uh, t weighted sequence that allows me to reformat in any plane and also allows me to compare with the contralateral side which is very useful this is the way we plan this uh, uh, protocol and this is the type of images that we obtain here in uh, coronal plane you can see all the segments of the right brachial plexus from the neural foramina all the way to the axillary region in basically a single image but at the same time we can appreciate that the segments of the left brachial plexus are starting to appear one more click and now i see all the segments of the contralateral brachial plexus from the neural foramina all the way to the axillary region and this is very helpful for comparison purposes And then we can evaluate the segments of the brachial plexus also in the sagittal plane this is a plane that i uh, like very much we see here the uh, roots of the brachial plexus within the scalene triangle we keep on going and now we are at the edge of the scalene triangle so these are the trunks which become the divisions divisions and now we're in between the clavicle and the first rib so as soon as uh, these dots uh, pass uh, below they become the cords of the brachial plexus which are right here and then these are the cords we keep on following them and as soon as we see the anterior coracoid process which is right there these become the proximal branches of the brachial plexus The other protocol that we use is uh, a protocol that I developed when I was doing my fellowship at McGill University. The whole point of this protocol was to uh, decrease the scanning time. We're not doing a very good job and the patients were staying too long in the magnet, which translated into poor quality images. So we tried different things. We uh, tweaked the parameters without a real success until we came up with a, a very simple solution which was to increase the number of slices uh, for planning the uh, coronal localizer. So when the patient goes into the magnet, this is what the technologist is going to do. They're going to plan the coronal localizer of these uh, very thick slices and this is what they get. As you can see here, the brachial plexus is not clearly seen and therefore the technologist has to image a large chunk of tissue from approximately C4 to T4, including the heart and parts of uh, the lung. So what we did was to increase the number of slices in order to obtain that localizer. And this is what we got. Um, this is the coronal localizer using the thin slices. And now you can appreciate where the brachial plexus is located. And since we can see where the brachial plexus is, we can now plan the study accordingly. And this is exactly what we did. As you can see here, we are avoiding the heart and, and most of the lung, which also decreases the possibility of uh, uh, motion and respiratory artifacts. And then, as a surprise, this was the uh, first image that we obtained. This came as a bonus. Uh, this is an axial oblique T1 weighted sequence where we can see in a single image all the segments of the brachial plexus all the way from the neural foramina to the axillary region. In the same uh, fashion of this axial oblique data set, we plan the coronal images and you can appreciate how in a single image we can uh, uh, see almost all the segments of the brachial plexus from the neural foramina all the way to the axillary region. We plan the uh, sagittal images in the same fashion. And at the end of the day, we were able to decrease the scanning time by about 14 minutes. Then, uh, given the quality of the images, we ended up uh, removing a couple of additional sequences. So this is a protocol that nowadays takes between 20 and 22 minutes. So this is the planning of that uh, uh, protocol, that type of imaging of the brachial plexus. As you can see, we obtain axial oblique uh, images, not true axial images, but you uh, can appreciate how in a single image we can uh, see all the segments of the brachial plexus, again, from the neural foramina all the way to the axillary uh, region in the axial oblique plane. And here, here's the planning of the coronal oblique images. C4 
similar to our previous uh, scan in a single image we kind of see all the segments of the brachial plexus from the neural foramina all the way to the axillary region maybe one more and we see a little bit more of the branches so we published this uh, in 2013 this is the article uh, please send me an email if you're if you would be interested in uh, using this protocol in your institution we'll be more than happy to send it to you so now allow me to uh, illustrate the benefits of this uh, technique with uh, an example this is a uh, 27 year old patient who back in 2005 presented with left ulnar neuropathy and you can see indeed the uh, asymmetry of both hands there is significant atrophy of the intrinsic muscles of the hand on the left side predominantly between the first and the uh, second fingers so the patient was seen by a neurology and they diagnosed left ulnar neuropathy they were convinced that this was likely secondary to a mass in the proximal left ulnar nerve and they requested an mri of the brachial plexus so this is the MRI using a conventional technique back in 2005, which was reported as normal. And indeed, uh, there is no evidence of mass in the left brachial plexus. The patient uh, had a yearly follow-up. All of the studies reported as normal until 2011, when he found out that we were using this modified technique through his wife, who happens to be one of our MR technologists. So we uh, scanned him with the uh, new uh, modified technique and these are selected images of that study that show that there is a fusiform avidly enhancing mass lesion in the proximal left ulnar nerve that ended up being a schwannoma as originally suspected what happened well probably with the conventional technique the lesion was not included in the field of view or if it was included it was just at the edge of the field of view uh, doing some um, with some volume averaging with the adjacent uh, uh, vessels so brachial plexopathies represent a clinical challenge because the symptoms are often vague and non-specific. Trauma is the most common cause of brachial plexopathy, followed by neoplastic involvement. There are three main patterns of uh, traumatic nerve injury. The first one is known as uh, neuropraxia or a stretch injury, where basically the axon is intact, but there's going to be injury of the surrounding endoneurium and the peroneurium. Basically, what we're going to see on imaging is swelling of the nerve and increased T2 signal. Then we have axonodmesis, which is equivalent to a partial tear. Here you can see that there is injury to the axon uh, and there is injury to the surrounding running endoneurium and the perineurium. Here we're going to see also a swelling of the nerve increased T2 signal, which is a slightly more marked. But in addition, we can see some effacement of some of the uh, fascicles. Again, a partial tear. And finally, the worst type of injury is going to be a nerve transection, uh, also known as a neuroadmesis. So here we have uh, two examples of uh, uh, traumatic postganglionic nerve injury. Uh, the patient on the left was involved in a motor vehicle accident, and we can see that there is a thickening and increased signal intensity of all the visualized segments of the right brachial plexus, secondary to neuropraxia or a stretch injury. The patient on the right uh, had a ski accident, and we see that there is uh, increased signal intensity and swelling of the C8 nerve root within the scalene triangle. But we can also appreciate that there is a focal area of discontinuity of that nerve that represents a partial tear in the context of severe axonodmesis. So uh, what should we do if we're suspecting preganglionic injury? Well, in those cases, we need to use high resolution 3D T2 weighted sequences. So myelographic type sequences in order to identify the ventral and the dorsal rootlets at uh, any uh, given uh, level. Uh, here we have a normal volunteer where we see very nicely the rootlets on both sides. And here we have a patient with suspected preganglionic injury on the right side, and indeed there is absence of the rootlet secondary to nerve 
root uh, abortion. Uh, these uh, patients often, often have uh, an associated in injury of uh, the uh, dura. There is uh, um, a dural tear that can lead to post-traumatic pseudomeningocils. And we can see here a large pseudomeningocil extending from the neural foramen all the way to the uh, scalene uh, triangle. These patients can also present with muscle edema as fast as within the next 24 to uh, 48 hours. Here's a companion case of a patient involved in a motor vehicle accident, and we can appreciate that there's significant thickening and increased T2 signal of all the visualized segments of the right brachial plexus in keeping with stretch injury. In addition, this patient has uh, um, post-traumatic pseudomeningocils at uh, two levels, and the nerve roots are not clearly identified. Indeed, here in the sagittal plane, we don't see them, so there was associated nerve root avulsion. So imaging studies play a key role in making the difference between preganglionic and postganglionic injury, a difference that is crucial for determining the management of these patients. Indeed, preganglionic rupture, as we've seen in our example, is uh, treated with the nerve transfer, while patients with postganglionic injury could benefit from conservative treatment or from nerve grafting. In terms of neoplastic involvement, uh, nerve shift tumors are the most common uh, tumors to involve the brachial plexus. Here we have a patient who presented with uh, left-sided brachial plexopathy, and we see that there is a focal mass lesion centered in the divisions of the left brachial plexus, demonstrating a peripheral enhancement with a target uh, sign or target pattern. As we know with uh, conventional imaging, it's difficult to make the difference between schwannoma and neurofibroma. And in this case, this ended up being a neurofibroma. Some cases can be more dramatic, like in this uh, patient with NF1, where we see multiple lesions involving all the segments of the right brachial plexus, but we see additional lesions in the soft tissues of the neck and along the chest wall of this patient. Advanced imaging may prove uh, helpful. These are images from an article from uh, the Geneva uh, group where they were trying to demonstrate the benefits of a tractography. And you can see in this patient with a large mass lesion centered in the course of the left brachial plexus how the fiber tracts are going around the lesion. With this in mind, the authors of this uh, paper thought that this could represent a schwannoma. That was the information conveyed to the uh, surgeons. They took the patient to the OR and they were able to enucleate the lesion, which turned out to be indeed a schwannoma. Different from this uh, patient with a large mass lesion involving the uh, proximal roots of the right brachial plexus, where we can see that some of the uh, fibers are going around the lesion, but most of them are embedded within the lesion in a patient with a benign neurogenic tumor that, of course, was not resected. And here we have uh, another patient presented with uh, left-sided brachial plexopathy. And we can see uh, the reason right away. There is a large uh, mass centered in the left upper lung, extending through the chest wall into the axillary region. This mass demonstrates uh, heterogeneous enhancement with a large area of central necrosis. In addition, there is uh, thickening, clumping, and uh, uh, abnormal enhancement of the proximal brachial plexus in a patient a pancoast tumor. And again, from the uh, previous article that I mentioned, you can see another patient with a pancoast tumor with the mass extending through the apical fat pad into the scalene triangle. And we can see the destruction and irregularity of uh, the uh, fiber tracts in the area of the root of that uh, right brachial plexus. This is an interesting case of uh, a patient who presented with uh, significant pain in the left arm. And we can see that there are two masses, one centered in the cord and the other one in the proximal uh, branches of the left uh, brachial plexus, both uh, masses uh, demonstrating um, homogeneous post-gadolinium enhancement. And the rest of the brachial plexus is also abnormal, showing uh, clumping, thickening, and uh, enhancement. Well, this is not pathognomonic of anything in particular. So the patient had a biopsy, which turned out to be 
neurolymphomatosis. Uh, so neurolymphomatosis occurs when there is a direct involvement of the peripheral nervous system by lymphoma, involvement of the endoneurium, and this is in 95% of the cases related to B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. In less than 5% of cases, it could be T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides. What's interesting about this case who presented, uh, of this patient who presented with left brachial plexopathy is that the primary lymphoma was actually in the abdomen, but the first symptoms uh, came up after involvement of the left brachial plexus. Another entity that is important to uh, discuss is post-radiation fibrosis of the brachial plexus. So the typical scenario is a patient with prior history of uh, a cancer who receives radiation and many years later presents with brachial plexopathy. And the question that we uh, receive from the clinicians is, uh, are we dealing with uh, radiation fibrosis or is this a tumor recurrence of or metastatic disease? So uh, this happens usually in patients who have received more than 60 gray and they present with progressive neuropathy that's usually the result of uh, fibrosis. So how do we tell in, uh, with imaging if we're dealing with post-radiation fibrosis or with uh, tumor recurrence or metastatic disease? Well, there are um, some imaging findings that could be helpful. Uh, the first one being that these patients present with diffuse thickening of the segments of the brachial plexus that were included in the field of radiation, such as in this patient with prior history of breast CN radiation, where we see that there is significant thickening of the visualized segments of the right brachial plexus, but there is no uh, clear discrete focal mass, it's diffuse thickening and involvement of the segments of the brachial plexus. And this was indeed a patient with radiation plexopathy that remained stable for many years. Here's another example of a patient with breast uh, cancer and uh, prior radiation presented also with left brachial plexopathy. And we see that there is a, a thickening and clumping of the visualized segments of the brachial plexus. But importantly, uh, these segments of the brachial plexus show very low signal intensity in this coronal stir and in the coronal T2, something that is unlikely to happen in the context of uh, a tumor. So this is another finding that we can commonly see in the context of radiation fibrosis. Um, this patient also remains stable for many years. And one important point is that contrast is not always helpful because you can have uh, post-contrast enhancement in the context of uh, radiation fibrosis and into more uh, recurrence or metastatic disease. What else uh, could be of use? Here we have uh, two uh, different patients who presented with uh, right-sided brachial plexopathy. The patient on the left shows that there is a thickening and increased signal intensity of the right uh, T1 nerve root, which also demonstrates increased uh, signal on DWI. The patient on the right shows a uh, large mass lesion involving the proximal segment of the rectal plexus. This was a patient with a prior history of a uh, round cell sarcoma of the brachial plexus that was treated with radiation 12 years uh, before. So uh, we can see that there is increased signal intensity in the periphery of this lesion in the uh, stir uh, sequence and also uh, slightly increased signal of the brachial plexus in the ADC map. Well, it turns out that this uh, patient had uh, metastatic uh, breast uh, cancer and the authors of this uh, paper from the UCSF group published in the JNR in 2015 found that the ADC um, uh, measurement of this particular patient was 0.95, while the ADC of this patient was high at 2.59. So uh, they concluded in their article that uh, uh, patients with ADC equal or greater than 1.3 are likely to represent radiation fibrosis, while patients with uh, ADC lower than 1.1 uh, uh, are more suggestive to have involvement by um, a cancer. And when necessary, of course, uh, we have to consider doing a uh, biopsy. 
Um, and uh, uh, finally, just to, to mention other potential causes of uh, brachial plexus involvement, here we have uh, two patients with uh, this one with intrinsic and this one with extrinsic infection. The patient on uh, our uh, left is a patient with uh, enterovirus myelitis that then extending into the right brachial plexus. And you can see that there is significant thickening and increased signal intensity of the root of the right brachial plexus. And this is a patient with an invasive fungal infection of the upper lung that extending through the chest wall into the uh, apical fat pad and from there to the scalene triangle involving the uh, roots and trunks of the right uh, brachial plexus. Of course, don't forget to look at the spine. Oftentimes, uh, patients presenting with radiculopathy, such as this one who presented with uh, right C7 radiculopathy, have a completely normal brachial plexus, and the problem is uh, secondary to degenerative disc disease. In this case, a disc extrusion extending into the right C6, C7 nerve foramen, compressing the right uh, C7 nerve root. So don't forget to look at the spine in all these uh, studies. So in conclusion, uh, remember the mnemonic from medial to lateral, the roots, the trunks, the divisions, the cords, and the branches. MRI is definitely the imaging method of choice to image the brachial plexus. However, it needs to be interpreted in the context of uh, a clinical history and when possible EMG studies. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed the lecture and feel free to uh, send me an email if you have uh, any questions or if you want uh, the article with uh, the uh, modified protocol. Thank you very much.